Welcome to the second video of the mini video series sponsored by Quality and Equality, an organization development consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. And my name is Mayan Chung Judge and I'm the director of the firm. This uh, mini series is called Just in Case. So just in case you need reminding of something and just in case you didn't know about this, just in case you need to refresh your memory about this theory or just in case there are something quite um, useful for organization development practice that you may need to chew on. So that's why the name just in case. And today we have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Professor Bob Marshak, who is a very well known global leaders in change. He's a scholar, he's a writer, he's an educationist. And um, he's going to talk about anxiety and change, which is a very big topic. And there are five questions that he would pose, kind of like his outline, to, um, to guide him through the key points that he wants to communicate. So, Bob, may I say thank you for actually investing time in this? And we are all looking forward to hear what you have to say. So over to you, Bob. Hello, my name is Bob Marshak, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about anxiety and change in organizations. For those interested in my background, I've been an organization change consultant, coach, educator, and author for more than 40 years. First, I'd like to talk about why I'm talking about anxiety and change now. The first thing I guess I should say is what do I mean by anxiety? And what I mean is there's some sense of distress or uneasiness uh, that people experience out of fear or discomfort, in this case brought on by a pending change or an actual change or the threat of change. The, the distress and the anxiety can be real. It can be imagined threats. The threats can be clear and present. They can be vague or anticipated, and the person can feel threatened physically, emotionally, or psychologically. So what I'm really talking about is in the workplace, people having some sense of fear and anxiety about what's happening to them or what might happen to them, and that that creates a dilemma for them and a dilemma for the organization as they try and cope with it. In my experience over my years of working with things, Leaders and consultants these days may acknowledge that change and anxiety go together, but I have found that they tend to downplay it. Oh, people might be a little bit anxious, but they'll get over it. And usually there's some notion that if we give them a rational analysis based on data, uh, that will carry the day and they will be convinced to do the change and we don't really have to spend much time on anxiety. I used to buy into that many years ago, but in recent years, I think two things have changed and that those changes are now having a greater impact. And because of that, I think consultants and leaders need to spend more attention on anxiety and anxiety related factors in organizations than they have been. The two things that for me have been happening is we have now in this new century moved into a VUCA world, V-U-C-A, volatile, uncertain, um, complex and ambiguous. It's a world that is different than the machine era organizations of the 1950s and 1980s, where bureaucracies could pretty much control what was going on. And while planning had to happen, it was within tighter constraints. Now there are many more layers of complexity that leaders and organizations must face, brought on by any number of factors in a global economy. The other factor that I have found, especially amongst consultants, is that at the end of the last century, the complexity sciences in physics and biology began to talk about self-organizing systems and order out of chaos. And this notion that, that chaotic systems could find their own order. And so I have colleague friends who used to figure that what they needed to do was to take an organization and its leadership to the, to the brink of uncertainty, to the edge of chaos, to the very cliff, and then let them self-organize themselves out of it. And I uh, would say to them things like, well, self-organization works for particles that don't have consciousness and don't have emotions, but people have emotions. What are you doing with the anxiety that those situations are bringing about? 
And the answer I would get back was, well, they would self-organize themselves out of it. I don't think that that really works. And I think in combination, the greater layers of complexity that we are facing and the notion that people can have anxiety about what to do next in this global economy of far reaching consequences to us, I think we need to pay more attention to it. Well, some anxiety and change uh, do go together. But I think most people who have done research on the subject would say that anxiety and change is a little bit like Goldilocks. You know Goldilocks. Goldilocks went out and said, this bed is too soft, this bed is too hard, this bed is just right. So th the notion is if there is too little anxiety, then there isn't enough motivation for people to change. The other factor is if there's too much anxiety, then people are uh, driven out of their fear to go into uh, debilitating reactions, they go into denial about what's going on, they go into un unconscious reactions, including denial, but also fight or flight of reactions, compensation or overcompensating, like we have nothing to fear, a uh, little bit of dependency, looking for somebody to tell them what to do, compensatory behavior where they act out their feelings of what's going on. So if there's too much anxiety, what you're getting is really unhelpful, often unconscious reactions to the change, where even though things need to be done, people could be in denial because they're so fearful to face it that they have to deny that it's actually happening. If you have just the right amount of anxiety, then that is a motivation to change. And of course, that's what we all desire. The dilemma, of course, in organizations as in life are that for some people, it's too much uh, anxiety and for other people, it's too little anxiety. So how do you get the right amount? Or even how do you know what the right amount is? But we do have to pay attention to it, and especially if we're having too much anxiety, because that will trigger a lot of unhelpful and often unconscious reactions. I also have found that it's helpful to think about anxiety in two ways. The first way is the one that I think most people are most familiar with, Certainly all my consultant colleagues and I were trained in, in back in the 70s and, and 80s in terms of bringing about change, uh, which was to increase the notion of, of the need for change. And that is survival anxiety, the fear of loss of uh, the organization, the fear of loss of one's job, the fear of loss of competitive advantage. Uh, the fear of loss can be, again, physical, emotional or psychological. This type of anxiety is thought to motivate people to want to change, and it's most often represented in the need to build the case for change, which convinces people that unless they do something, there will be some dire consequences that they have to face. Or the burning platform, to prevent pe present to people some notion about why we have to change, otherwise we're going to have, again, a dire consequences. The, this is all around increasing the amount of anxiety that people experience, so that they will change. But that neglects the other type of anxiety, which is less talked about, more emotional, and which many people will not admit to by its very nature. And that is learning anxiety, the fear of the inability to learn what needs to be done, the fear that the new you will not be liked by others, or the fear that if you are seen a certain way, people will categorize you as not very competent or not very bright or not very whatever because you're not carrying out your job the way you used to or the way people expect you to, uh, especially the notion of reduced competence. So we have situations in organizations where members of the organizations or leaders of the organization might fear acting in new ways because they will not be as competent at what they did before because they might be judged by others as not being very bright at what they do or carrying out their jobs and what they do. As I will say a little bit later in this discussion, this is especially true for leaders who have been trained and developed to be seen a certain way as heroic leaders. And if they act in other ways, many people will see them as potentially having lost their ability to lead because they're leading in a different way. So now we have two types of anxiety that we deal with, survival and learning, and they can go together. A quick little story is once upon a time when I was in the United States Army, courtesy of our draft, I was being trained to do a number of things which would have put me in an office type environment. And I had to learn how to type. 
which at that time I did not know how to do. And so I had two weeks of typing lessons. If I could pass a test to be able to type 30 words a minute or something like that without a single error, I would go on to be office clerk type person. If I could not pass that test in one minute, 30 words without an error, I would be sent combat infantry to a war zone. That created a lot of learning anxiety for me, which also went with survival anxiety. Now I knew how to type with three fingers because that's how I had gotten through college. And when it came time to do the test and I was placed in that situation, I typed with three fingers and continue to pass, I passed the test and I've continued to type with three fingers for the rest of my life. In any event, I think that there is an overemphasis now on uh, survival anxiety and not enough on learning anxiety, especially when we deal with leaders. So are we finding ourselves with leaders convincing them that they need to do something drastically different or the organization will not survive, but we as coaches, consultants, and members of the organization do not pay enough attention to the learning anxiety that they may be experiencing. So I think putting more attention to wondering how can we support people and how can we support leaders in dealing with learning anxiety is something that we might want to add to the types of things we think about and do in organizations. Now, I know right now what people are wondering, like, okay, uh, I hear what you're saying. Uh, what should we do about the potential that there's increased anxiety in the world of work, and especially when we're going to change? And how do we think about what we should do or not do? Well, some of the kinds of things that help deal with anxiety in general for the workforce, and as you think about what's going on in a change is, is there some way to put out, in addition to the need to change, some sense of boundaries or some measure of where there is certainty in the system? Can you clarify for people who will be making the decisions about change? What will be the processes that will be used in a change? What degree of risk or vulnerability is expected? So what you're trying to do is instead of having people have unlimited fear with no sense of what the possibilities are, to give them some sense of some boundaries, some sense of certainty, some ability of something to hold on to so they're not totally untethered, so that they're not totally left to their own thoughts about what might happen, but that there are some realistic boundaries for them to lean against. Can you provide some sense of psychological safety meaning that they will still in this change feel respected, that they will still feel valued, they will still feel that they are meaningfully involved in some way. These are all ways of signifying to someone that they are not a neglected person, that they are being thought about, that they are not totally on their own, and they're not totally in, up to their own fantasies about what are happening or not. That goes very much with another factor, which is can you increase the sense of trust? Now that may sound funny. Here we are, somebody's in the organization dealing with a change, perhaps an unwanted change. How do you increase trust? Well, you do that by living up to what you say. If you tell people that certain things are gonna happen, be realistic about it, be truthful about it. When they come true, then people will begin to trust your word. If you give them some sense of openness where you will listen to them and hear what they have to say, that also increases trust. And for God's sake, stay away from surprises saying, oops, we didn't tell you, but now we're going to drop this on you because we didn't think you could take it. No surprises as much as possible, as much openness as possible. Listen to what people say, build trust. Can you provide people with some degree or sense of control? Are they totally left to the decisions of other people? Or will there at some point in what the process, will there be some input by them? Will there be some ability for them to influence what happens to them? Will there be some ability for things to happen? Many years ago, when I worked in the uh, United States government, I was far part of a major reorganization of many government agencies. And we brought together 100 of the top people of the four agencies that were being merged together. And initially, there was opposition to that idea 
because it was all they're going to do is come in and they're going to gripe and complain because none of them want this reorganization. And it's just going to be one big gripe session. And I said, well, we don't bring them in to talk about if they want the change. We bring them in to tell them that there will be a change. And what we want their in input on is how to make it the best reorganization they've ever been part of, because they've all been part of government reorganizations before, and this is their chance to do it right. So here we were giving them some sense of control on how something happened, but no sense of control over if it would happen, because that was decreed by presidential order. The other part of building some sense of control, some sense of certainty, some sense of boundaries, is can you give them some realistic expectation of what's going to happen going forward? Some notion of what will happen in three months, six months, a year, some expectations of how things will be decided or not decided, some sense of expectations of what the requirements will be of them or not. And the final thing, going back to the notion of learning anxiety, is can you provide coaching and training in appropriate performance expectations as they learn new ways of thinking, doing, and being. In other words, I'm going into a new job. I may have to deal with new people in new ways. There may be different expectations of me. I may have to operate with new types of technology. I may have to carry out my job differently. What is a realistic expectation of my learning curve? Am I supposed to do it perfectly after two weeks training? In which case I will revert to old behavior that I, that I know that I rely on. Or will there be a break-in period and a ramp up where I learn how to do things a little bit better than I have, or maybe I get some training, or there is some expectation that I do have a learning curve and that people do understand that. And that the option is not learn to do it perfect immediately or some really dire consequence is going to happen, in which case people will deal with unconscious behavior or they'll revert to old behavior that they can rely on. There are some additional things I want to mention, though, and that is uh, there are, I think, now differences in how leaders have to lead. Not in everything, not in every organization, not in all cases, but it's part of the changed expectations of the world of work we're in. In the past century, leaders learned how to and were taught mostly how to be heroic leaders. They learned how to command and control. They learned how to be visionary people who had the right answer, who could direct people on how to do things. And they addressed what Heifetz, a, a, a scholar of leadership calls technical problems, which is that there were problems in the, in the organization that you worked with to improve your performance. And they would often pursue planned change interventions, which could be, be participatory or expert driven, but were more like social engineering, where rational data-based objective analyses were used either by expert individuals or by involving people to solve problems. That is a way of, of operating that many uh, leaders will turn to, and it doesn't work in the situations of high complexity, high ambiguity, high uncertainty, and dealing with multiple layers of complexity of problems that we are facing today. Leaders are now challenged to have new ways of thinking and acting, and that includes the ability to deal with Heifetz calls adaptive challenges. That means challenges to what are going on that are hard to describe, hard to delineate, hard to name, hard to work on rationally and where the solution is some iterative adaptive action that is good enough to move the organization along until the next adaptive action is taken to try and move the organization along. No perfect solutions, no one-time de decision that makes something done, no leader sitting up in some office coming up with the brilliant solution. Instead, many people get involved. The role of the leader then is to deal with, with generative change, which is an approach to change where you're trying to have innovation or invent new ways by involving many voices, where you're creating supportive context, which is a role of the leader to provide supportive context rather than direction. And the supportive contexts are intended to create new ideas and have people desire to want to implement things that they've been working on. And where the, the solutions are come up through the social agreement of the many voices that have been part of this, and adaptive actions that they then commit to work on. That is a type of organization leadership 
that is being called for and where leaders are relying on the old forms of leadership because it reduces their anxiety about whether they are a competent leader. Many leaders today do not know how to turn things over to structured types of opportunities and contexts where people can contribute many different ideas to, to deal with something and then back that up because that's not seen as the heroic leader model. But a lot of that action is being called for today and it's a type of leadership that needs coaching and support and learning. So now I would like to speak specifically to leaders that are having to deal with highly complex, multiple layered uh, complexity uh, problems in their organization and issues in their organizations, and who are trying to learn to lead in new and different ways. So uh, there are a few things that you can try and do with them that I have found successful. One is to try and give them a coherent explanation about the world of work today. The world of work of 2020, which is when this is being taped, is quite different than the world of work of 1980. And today's organization leaders need to have be reminded of the complexity of it. They need to understand the complexity on it. They need to, to realize that it's calling for a different type and style of leadership. The second part of that, of course, is, are you able to explain a significant role for leaders that differs from command and control, including how to support others and change processes. This is not that the role of the leader is to step aside, do nothing, and let other people do things. This is a role of leadership that is sponsors innovative solutions, that brings people together and provides resources, that provides support and encouragement, and allows and brings into the, the thinking of things many different ideas in supportive contexts that allow creativity to emerge, new and interesting types of possibilities that leaders encourage to be carried out by members of the organization. There is a significant role for a leader, but it is a different role of leader. The third part of that is, can you, if you are in a coaching, consulting, or even a colleague role, provide coaching and support to help leaders let go of their old models of leadership, to let go of what they thought they needed to do to be competent and to be seen competently, and to encourage them and allow them to learn new ways to stimulate greater innovation in organizations and bring more people and voices and ideas into solutions and implementations. A fourth part of it is that the, it's up to the leader in many ways, but other people is, to create safe enough conditions while things are going on for people to, in fact, create new ideas. If you bring a bunch of people into a room with many different voices who have not necessarily worked together before and are not being under strong leadership, they need to have a context that is safe. It needs to be supportive. It needs to be an arena. And that calls for certain kinds of ground rules and certain kinds of facilitation and a certain kind of encouragement that increases the opportunity for creativity and innovation as opposed to deep levels of analysis and criticism, which will run in the opposite direction. And the final piece that I offer to, to the people who are listening to this, whether you're a consultant, a coach, a manager, or working for somebody is, you need to spend some time, especially in today's world, thinking about working on and developing your own self so that you're able to manage your own anxieties that come up in these kinds of situations. Am I competent to help this leader? Do I know the way of consulting that will work? Do I need more training? What about my fear of losing my job because I won't do something correctly or this organization will go out of business? So am I acting clean enough with my own centeredness and my own sense of uh, confidence in what I'm doing, but not, uh, not arrogance about that, but clarity, so that I am someone who is not looking fearful and my fear and anxiety doesn't drip out into the system in ways that say, oh my God, Bob's concerned, if he's concerned, we should be even more concerned. I don't mean false confidence and I don't mean false arrogance. What I mean is being centered and clear about your own stresses and your own anxieties so that you can work in this kind of a world of work and that you can recognize the need to acknowledge and work with anxiety 
in organizations, not that it goes away, but that it can be managed in ways that will be more fruitful and allow for greater performance, greater creativity, and greater accomplishment. Thanks for being with me today, and thanks for listening to me. Good luck, everybody. Wow, what a lot of learning you have um, given us, Bob. May I, on behalf of the audience, to say a huge thank you for you to invest such your time and effort in order to uh, share your wisdom with us on this very big topic, Coincidity and Change. And uh, we hope all of you have enjoyed Bob's presentation. Maybe the best way forward is to have a number of your friends and colleagues having watched the video to sit around and discuss how this video would be of use to you at work. Um, I want to direct you to the description of this YouTube video where you will find Bob's biography and contribution and the various relevant articles he has written and his email address to contact him in case you want to take up this topic with him. And so may I wish you all a good week. And Bob, may I say thank you again for your contribution uh, to the field and on this video.